So Emily brought this up the first day in her very first opening lecture, and she talked about looking at the age of the patient and how that gives you so much information as to what the differential diagnosis for that patient is going to be. And I think that's true in a lot of pediatrics, and I like it because it really simplifies those algorithms in my head. Yes, is it possible that an adult could get a pathology that I usually attribute to a small child? Absolutely, adults can get Kawasaki disease, adults can get inosusception, but for the most part, knowing how old a child is helps me hone in on what pathologies I'm thinking about. And the area in which I find that to be most profoundly true is gastroenterology. So this is a great lecture for me because it's one of those areas where I really separate things in my head into what a child's going to get given their age. I mean, I'm not saying you can't have an ectopic pregnancy if you're not in this 12 to 18 year old range, but really I'm not considering it in my toddlers. Middle schmerz, PID, these are things that I'm looking at in my adolescence. Of course, appendicitis, gastroenteritis, those things are going to be across the entire spectrum. So for the purposes of this lecture, we're really going to focus on these pediatric complaints, these complaints in the first year of life that are so exclusive to a pediatric and even an early infantile population. Starting, of course, with omphalitis. This is an absolutely terrifying disease. It is luckily pretty rare. And what this is, is an infection of the umbilical stump. Now, when I had my first son, the standard of care was still to clean the umbilical stump every diaper change with alcohol. And I loved it. It was very clean. It wasn't oozy. It wasn't disgusting. And then a couple of years later, they decided that the alcohol was a little bit irritating and that the bacteria, the good bacteria that grow on the skin will help eat through that cord and it will come off sooner if we stop cleaning it with alcohol. And so the standard of care became not to clean the umbilical stump with alcohol at all. Don't tell our pediatrician, I did not follow that at all. I have cleaned every one of my kids' umbilical stumps with alcohol because I think that is disgusting to let the bacteria eat through the umbilical stump. That having been said, it also changed what I was seeing in the emergency department a lot. I have a lot of patients coming in now because their kid's cord is a little oozy. There's a little discharge. It doesn't smell fantastic. And most of the time, it's just that. It's just normal bacteria or maybe it's an umbilical granuloma or something like that that's not particularly clinically significant. But I really do look at every one of these patients with an umbilical complaint and consider whether or not this could be omphalitis. And sometimes it'll be a little bit red, maybe from the cord rubbing, maybe from the diaper rubbing. And in those cases, I will take off the diaper and I will observe that child for a while because omphalitis typically will start out as just a simple cellulitis around the umbilical stump. Unfortunately, it progresses very rapidly to much deeper infections and can be catastrophic with a mortality of 7 to 15 percent. Now, there are a number of risk factors for this, and most of them are risk factors that are very obvious, right? Anything that would put you at increased risk of early neonatal infection. Did you have prolonged rupture of membranes? Did mom have an infection? Was it a delivery at home? Were your umbilical vessels catheterized at any point? We talked about doing a UV line yesterday. Did I do a UV line on you in the emergency department? Are you low birth weight? There are also a lot of weird things that are recommended to put on kids' umbilical stumps by different organizations, different people. Some people put soot on them. Some people put ghee on them, which is a type of clarified butter. Some people put saliva on them. There's all different kinds of weird things. I mean, for you know, me being mocked for putting alcohol on my kid's umbilical stump, I think it's probably a little bit better if it had been clarified butter. That having been said, there are a lot of reasons for a kid to get this type of an infection. And I did have a friend once text me. And she said, sent me a picture that looked very much like this second picture here and said, hey, does this kid have umphalitis? And for whatever reason, I was busy. I didn't get back. I didn't see the text. 45 minutes later, she sent another text that said, never mind. Because in the time that she was waiting for me to text back, the kid's umbilical area went from looking like this to looking like this. And that's the other reason that I take off the diaper and I watch the kid for a little while. On one hand, I want to see if it was just rubbing against the diaper, that redness will go away. But if it really is umphalitis, it will probably progress very rapidly. So if you ever have a question, 
just watching that kid for a little while and seeing the progression can be very helpful. So what you are looking for is progression to something like sepsis, peritonitis, or necrotizing fasciitis. These are the really bad things that can happen. So in a child who already has signs of those, who already has systemic signs, poor feeding, irritability, maybe they're febrile, they have abdominal tenderness, you feel crepitance in the abdominal wall, you're done at that point. You're treating it as umphalitis. In a kid that has that teeny bit of redness, you might keep them there for a little bit, observe them, see if it gets better, or see if it progresses, both in size of cellulitis or including some of these features. Now this can look a little bit different in different kids. And I would say that if you look at the second kid, you can almost see a hemorrhagic blister forming. I think this kid has necrotizing fasciitis. This child also, these lesions that we see are separate from the umbilical cord, right? And that skip lesion appearance is also very characteristic of necrotizing fasciitis. So I think those two kids have actually progressed to neck fasci. So for anybody with umphalitis, I'm doing a full septic workup and I'm starting a lot of antibiotics. I'm getting my surgeon involved in case this is a necrotizing infection and I'm giving probably Clinda in, for the neck fasc component as well as Vanco, Ampicillin and Gentamicin or something similar. And I'm getting that child into a PICU setting. Speaking of necrotizing, we also have necrotizing enterocolitis. I don't see this a ton in the emergency department because this is really a disease primarily of preemies. And when I have seen it in the emergency department, it has been a child who had a significant degree of shock that they were hypoperfusing their intestines. Usually a kid with something like a hypoplastic left heart syndrome. I know Emily talked about cardiac stuff. Someone maybe with a really bad coarc where their gut was so poorly perfused that it was prone to become ischemic. So in necrotizing enterocolitis, what happens is you get inflammation in the intestines and that allows for the introduction of gas producing bacteria as well as for ischemia. So this is obviously a very high mortality condition. Not only do you have inflammation, but you also have ischemia and you have infection with really bad organisms. The time that I remember seeing this a lot was in the NICU. And when I did my NICU rotation, we'd have these preemies and we'd start them on NG tube feeds at like something ridiculous, like one ml per hour, right? And then all of a sudden, a couple of hours later, you look across the room and this kid's abdomen has totally blown up. You can literally see the loops of bowel through the abdominal wall. They're like vomiting buckets. Obviously, if you wait long enough and they start to have bowel ischemia, they could have hematochesia as well. And everybody descends on this child and they're like, stop the feeds. Are they stopped? Are they stopped? And I'm like, I, I, they were going at one ml an hour. I don't know. I don't even know how to see if they're still going or not. But it is amazing like how susceptible these little kids are. And they can also then become septic and shocky. The one thing I love about necrotizing enterocolitis is that the definitive diagnostic study is an x-ray. So one of the few things that the plain film is it, plain film and then you're done. And you're looking for a couple of things on the plain film, right? We, you're looking for these dilated loops of bowel, which are typically very obvious. And then you're looking for this air. If you look at those arrows, there is actually pneumatosis intestinalis. There is air in the bowel wall from the gas producing organisms and the ischemia and that longer arrow shows air in the portal venous system. So there's portal venous air as well. These kids are going to need antibiotics. They're gonna need fluid resuscitation. They're going to need a surgical consult, although typically they're not gonna actually get surgery. The time that they're gonna actually get surgery because they are very fragile children who are not going to survive a surgery well is if they have a perforation, which is the other thing that you're going to be able to assess for on your plain film, or if they actually have ischemic bowel. So a child who started to have bloody stools or you see signs of bowel ischemia on the x-ray. Congenital diaphragmatic hernias are interesting. I mean, technically this is an abdominal problem, but it's an abdominal problem that presents very much as a respiratory issue, right? So there's a few ways that this can happen. Usually it happens very early on. It can happen in a delayed fashion. If it happens in utero and all of your intestines, maybe your liver, maybe your spleen as well, ended up in your chest cavity, that's obviously devastating because the lung on that side is not gonna be able to form and you're probably gonna have lung hypoplasia. 
If you're okay until birth, but your intestines pop through your diaphragm and take up that lung space after you're born, you're probably also going to have respiratory issues just because that lung is kind of pushed out of the way. But once it's identified and fixed, that lung will be okay. And then the third option, which is the rarer option, is that it actually presents as a bowel issue because the extruded bowel causes a bowel obstruction. Now, I saw a kid who was about four. She did have a syndrome, so was more prone to this than other children that don't have some congenital issues. She came in after a sibling had thrown a toy at her chest, and she was having a lot of vomiting and some difficulty breathing. So we'd shoot a chest x-ray. I'm thinking, did the sibling cause a rib fracture? Like, this is insane. And she had a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. I don't know if it had just ruptured or if it had been that way for a while and it was kind of an incidental finding because I did the chest x-ray, but she had an entire lung field was gone, just filled with bowel. I wanted to take the sibling in and be like, look what you did. Stop throwing things at people. But unfortunately, they weren't there. She ended up fine. All right, always look in the diaper, right? Incarcerated inguinal hernias are another cause of abdominal issues in kids. Luckily, they're very visible, you know, very easy to pick up as long as you just remember to do that part of the exam. If it looks like this is strangulated, you have skin changes, extreme tenderness over the area, maybe they have signs of obstruction, lots of emesis, bilious emesis, obstipation, that's something that's gonna go to the OR with the surgeon relatively rapidly. For all other patients, I'm gonna to try to reduce this. I'm gonna throw an ice pack in the diaper, come back in a little bit, maybe give some pain medication, nudge on it a little bit. If I can get that, it back in, they're going to be a candidate for an outpatient surgical referral. Our surgeons are very split on whether or not this should be done as quickly as possible, because obviously it's gonna pop back out and it could become incarcerated, or if they should wait until the child's a little bit better, a little bit bigger so that they have better anesthesia outcomes. And different surgeons are different. There's no clear consensus on that. I will mention one other thing on hernias in little kids. Girls can actually have their ovaries herniate as well. And so if you see a girl who has a little hernia and there's just this tiny like almond s object in there, not the time to get every medical student in the hospital, come, come look at this hernia and definitely not the time to try to reduce it. Make sure it's not the ovary before you push too much on that thing. All right, malrotation. Malrotation. When I hear that word, does anyone else feel this way? My blood pressure goes up because I remember that embryology class where you had to learn exactly how much the gut is supposed to rotate and what's supposed to happen and when it goes back in and when it comes out. Did anybody else have to memorize all that? Is this like traumatizing even saying the word malrotation? For some reason, it was very hard for me to remember. So all I remember is that at some point in utero, your gut is supposed to come out and it's supposed to twist a whole bunch and it's supposed to go back in. And once it goes back in, there are these fibrous bands that are keeping your cecum in your right lower quadrant. Now, if this process fails in some way, if your gut goes out and it doesn't quite rotate enough, when it comes back in, not only is everything in the wrong place, but there's two big issues that are really clinically important. One is that those fibrous bands that were supposed to keep your cecum safe and secure are now all in the wrong place and your bowel can get caught up on them and you can get bowel obstructions. The other thing is because of the way the rotation occurs in this disorder, your mesentery is a very narrow pedicle and the small bowel is just kind of free floating and can move a great deal. And so what can happen is that that free floating small bowel can twist that narrow mesentery and cause obstruction of not only the bowel, but the very blood flow to the bowel itself. And that is when malrotation becomes mid-gut volvulus. Now, does that always happen? Absolutely not. There are people who have malrotation diagnosed on autopsy. There are adults every once in a while who get in a car accident, get a CT they probably didn't need, and have malrotation diagnosed incidentally on CT. Some people never volvulize, they never present. But of the people who do present, 50% will be 50% will present by one month of life and about 90% will present by a year. So it's really the little kids that are uniquely susceptible to having this volvulus happen.
So if you see a child with bilious emesis in the first month of life, this is going to be your go-to, just playing the odds based on numbers. And about 30% of kids who have bilious emesis in the first month of life are going to have malrotation with midgut volvulus. Obviously, there's other signs. They might have abdominal distension. They might have septic shock. They might have tenderness. If their bowel has become ischemic, they might have hematochesia. But really, that bilious emesis alone is going to be enough to trigger a workup in every situation in a child under one month of age for malrotation with midgut volvulus. Now, I am doing something wrong when I ask families about bilious emesis because I cannot tell you how many times I have said, you know, does your child have bilious emesis or does your child, is, what color is the emesis? Is it green? Is it yellow? And we have charts on the walls and I'm like, is it this color? Is it this color? Is it this color? And they're like, no, 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 no. But they have this giant diaper bag sitting there, right? And you know, there's always a diaper with poop in there that they want to show you because they all want to show you their kid's poop, right? And so I say to them, I'm like, so your kid's been vomiting all day. Do you have anything in that diaper bag with vomit on it? And invariably they will pull out a burp pad or a bib or an outfit that has bright green emesis. And in a world where every parent tries to make their kids sound as sick as possible to get your attention, no, I swear the temperature was 120. Really, that's what my thermometer said. I don't understand why I have such a hard time getting a bilious emesis history out of parents, but I really do often have to work for it. And this is a huge distinction point for me in terms of my workup. Because if I have a kid who's had bilious emesis, I probably will start with an x-ray just to make sure there's not an obvious perforation, but usually the x-ray is going to be normal. If you do find an abnormality, it might be a gasless abdomen. This is, of course, the classic x-ray, and this is the double bubble sign, right? Because remember, volvulus happens right after the duodenum. So you have the bubble in the stomach, you have the bubble in the duodenum, and then theoretically an entirely gasless abdomen distal to that. So if you have this double bubble sign, you either have duodenal atresia or malrotation with midgut volvulus, depending on the symptoms. And so that's pretty diagnostic, but you're going to go ahead and go to an upper GI. And what you're looking for on an upper GI is going to be this corkscrew sign right here in the lower lower right-hand corner. You also, if you would like, can do an ultrasound. Upper GI is very good for malrotation. It sometimes misses volvulus, but in the right clinical setting, you're going to assume that if the child has malrotation, they may have volvulus. As they clearly have volvulus as well if they're having symptoms for it. And it does have some false positives. So you may do an upper GI for another reason, and get a false positive. That having been said, if the kid has a perfect clinical picture and you get a positive upper GI, I would say you're done. If your center is very good at ultrasound or for some reason you want to do a confirmatory study, the sensitivity is a little bit lower for ultrasound, but we can do that as well. And people like fun names. You're looking for the whirlpool sign on that. If you do have a malrotation with midgut volvulus, NPO, IV fluid resuscitation, Call a pediatric surgeon immediately. Chris told a very compelling story yesterday about a kid who waited six hours and lost most of their small bowel. This isn't all coming in the morning. This isn't put them on the peds floor and wait for them to continue to vomit bilious emesis. This is the surgeon needs to come in absolutely immediately. And if it is a resident who doesn't understand the acuity of it, then it is our job to make sure that they do understand the acuity of this particular condition. They also will get antibiotics. Now, if you do have a kid with bilious emesis and they don't have malrotation with midgut volvulus, I have to say the differential for bilious emesis is still pretty bad. The atresias like duodenal atresia, Hirschsprung's enterocolitis can cause it, which is also a surgical emergency. Look for that incarcerated hernia if you haven't already. And then we talked about malrotation. So there isn't a lot in that first month of life that isn't pretty bad that would cause bilious emesis. Pyloric stenosis, on the other hand, is characterized by non-bilious emesis. They are throwing up everything that they eat. <laughs> Somebody asked the other day, how do you tell vomiting from reflux? And of course you're going to ask the parents, but I think it's kind of a difficult question for parents to answer, right? And if you're asking the question, how do you tell projectile emesis from regular emesis from reflux, the answer is absolutely don't.
ask the parents. At least don't ask them the question, does your child have projectile emesis? Because when this is studied, 80% of patients' parents, when the patient has just gastroesophageal reflux, nothing more than that, will say that their child has projectile emesis. Because of course, it's their baby, it's scary, it's coming out like a projectile, they're gonna call it projectile emesis. I had a resident once, back when I was at Children's, who had had pyloric stenosis himself as a child. And he said his parents would use him as a weapon. So one of them would be holding him and they'd be like, do you want to change his diaper? And the other parent would be like, no, I don't want to change his diaper. And they'd hear him start to vomit. And they'd be like, really? And then he'd projectile emesis right at the other parent. He was like a water gun of formula and breast milk. And so that's how I kind of ask parents. I'll be sitting here, right? You know, they're sitting here. I'm sitting here. And I'll say, all right, so you're holding the baby upright on your lap right now, sitting up. If your baby throws up, the way they typically do at home right now, who's getting hit with the vomit? Is the vomit gonna hit me over here? Is it gonna hit your shoes? Or is it gonna be all over the baby and you're gonna be washing that outfit? Most of the time they tell me they're gonna be washing the outfit, that it's gonna hit the baby, right? And then I say, does it come out of the nose too? And they're like, yeah, it comes out of the nose all the time. That's usually gastroesophageal reflux. If they say no, not even going to hit the baby. It's going to hit my shoes. It's going to hit you. That is projectile emesis. And that's a kid where I'm going to be worried about pyloric stenosis. These kids tend to present, peak time is about five weeks of age. Usually three to six weeks is the overall peak time. Up to 12 weeks is a reasonable time for pyloric stenosis. Because remember, the pyloric muscle is hypertrophying. It takes a little while to do that. It's working out, working out, working out, you know, and then it gets its guns around three to six weeks. So that's when these kids come in. And the history tends to be about a week of intermittent vomiting that may not have been projectile. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the week, as that py pylorus muscle has really hypertrophied, then it is projectile emesis, non-bilious every time. But of course, there's nothing else wrong with these children, right? So they're not sick. They want to eat. They are starving. So that is the other hallmark of pyloric stenosis. You put your gloved finger in that child's mouth, they are going to suck that glove down. They're starving because they really do want to be eating. They just can't. So the hungry non-bilious vomitor, that is the classic patient with pyloric stenosis. If you do labs, we talk about a hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. That is the classic lab finding that happens in absolutely nobody who is not on a board's exam. So you rarely, rarely, rarely see it in reality. It is, I think, good to check labs. You might see a little bump in the bilirubin. You want to make sure that this isn't like, you know, biliary atresia. They don't have a high conjugated bilirubin. You do probably want to make sure that this isn't congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So if you check the labs and you have a low sodium, a high potassium, and acidosis, that might change your differential a little bit. So there is value in getting the labs, but don't depend on having these classic lab findings because we typically don't. I'm not going to base this on whether or not this kid is hypochloremic, right? I'm going to base this on an ultrasound. You can do an upper GI, but an ultrasound is going to be the test of choice. And you're looking for basically a wider and longer pylorus muscle than normal. The measurements are three millimeters for one side of the pylorus or a length of, I think, 15 to 17. But that's something that I'm going to look up every time. And then in terms of treatment, we do have some time. This is not a surgical emergency. In fact, some countries don't even do surgery on these. They just keep the kid in the hospital and give them IV fluids until they outgrow the pyloric stenosis, which they eventually will do. But certainly you can fluid and electrolyte hydrate this child, and then they can go to surgery when it's convenient for the surgeon. But obviously they're gonna remain an inpatient on the pediatric ward until that happens. In a susception, we've talked about this a couple of times already in different lectures. This is the telescoping of the bowel by some lead point. Usually it's just going to be a little bit of lymphatic tissue. Maybe the kid had some diarrhea, the pyres patches got bigger, and one of them got caught and sucked some of the bowel into another loop of bowel. But sometimes it can be a meckles, it can be a lymphoma, it can sometimes be a pathologic lead point. This is most common in kids six months to two years although you can see it in any age group. I have to say I diagnosed it once in an adult, 
and the resident was presenting to me and I was like, okay, I know I always sound like a pediatrician and I know I treat adults like big kids, but this really sounds exactly like inosusception. And it was the only time I've ever diagnosed inosusception on CT because that's not the test of choice. We did a CT because it was an adult and they had inosusception. Usually though, it's gonna be in a much younger child and the classic presentation is going to be episodic abdominal pain with periods of lethargy in between the abdominal pain, vomiting, and bloody stool, which is a late finding because that bloody stool or that current jelly stool typically means that the kid has started to have bowel ischemia and that's actually the bowel sloughing off and coming out into the diaper. Not everybody has this classic triad. In fact, very, very few kids have the classic findings. About 70 to 80% will have either the vomiting or the, or the abdominal pain. About 30% will have the hematochesia. In terms of diagnosis, ultrasound, looking for that target sign you see right there is going to be probably the best and easiest way to diagnose this with a 95% sensitivity. You can also diagnose it on enema. The treatment is typically gonna be an enema. If a child is perforated, peritonitic, or dumping chunks of their bloody bowel into their diaper, you probably do not wanna do an enema on those kids. But the other kids who look relatively well are candidates for an enema, and it can be air, it can be saline, it can be ultrasound guided, it can be barium. Really does not seem to matter what you put up those kids' tush. You have a pretty good chance of reducing it with an enema. If you try a couple times and it doesn't reduce, then they need to go to the office operating room. And there's your barium enema. The thing about lethargy I think is very interesting. And I, Saul, are you in here somewhere? I have to give Saul props. Several years ago, there was a patient and I wasn't there. I heard the story because it was legendary who came in with a head trauma and they were lethargic. And the way I understand it is a relatively minor head trauma. And the kid was really, really, really lethargic. And somehow Saul I probably through thinking about maybe a non-accidental trauma issue, got from a diagnosis of minor head trauma to intussusception, which is what that kid eventually ended up having and being treated for. And the kid had no vomiting, no abdominal pain, no colics of pain, no crying, no bloody stool, just had lethargy. And some of these kids will present with isolated lethargy. And it's a tough diagnosis to make when that happens. Luckily, if you have access to ultrasound, it's a pretty painless non-radiation involving one. Meckel's diverticulum can be a lead point for intussusception. More commonly, we see Meckel's diverticulum with gastric tissue in it, presenting as a painful or painless GI bleed. It really can be either. This occurs in 2% of the population. It's relatively common. Does anyone in here have a Meckles that they know about? Because I mean, statistically, three of us do. We just don't know. So if nobody knows, it could still be you. Just so you know, it's out there. Um, this is typically going to be one of the causes of GI bleeding that we think of. Like I said, it could be painless, it can be painful, typically diagnosed on a Meckel scan, and these tend to be surgically removed, not emergently, but obviously depending on the degree of bleeding. This is one of the few clinically significant GI bleeds that you can get in pediatrics, so it may actually be an emergent resuscitation in terms of the amount that the child is bleeding. Now, colic is probably not actually an abdominal pain issue. Colic is probably the baby just kind of being irritated, cranky, having like a lot of sensory input at once, but parents always present as if it's a GI issue because if you are crying for three hours or more a day, you're gonna be swallowing a lot of air, right? So these kids get very gassy, they're farting all the time, they're turning all those weird colors and making all those horrible faces kids make when they have gas. And so the parents come in and their chief complaint is, usually like, my kid's crying because he's constipated, or my kid's crying because he has gas. But when you really tease it out, the problem is that the child has colic, and the gas is probably secondary to all the crying. So to just kind of review quickly the biz buzz for these GI emergencies, preemies, think of neck, bilious emesis, think of malrotation with midgut volvulus, the hungry projectile vomitor, think of pyloric stenosis, intermittent pain, non-tender between episodes with vomiting and possibly hematochesia. Think of intussusception. We didn't really talk much about the small bowel atresias or meconium ileus because that typically happens before the child is gonna leave the hospital is when that's gonna present painless or painful rectal bleeding. Think of Meckel's diverticulum. Gastroesophageal reflux is very, very common. 
but it can be a disease. And if a child is having extensive amounts of pain, multiple aspiration pneumonias, or is not growing on account of it, that is something that is going to need attention at some point. And obviously colic is excessive crying. And this is just kind of a nice little guide to think of when we think of kids coming in with abdominal pain, because even though it's easy to give a lecture when we talk about the pathology first, that's not how the child presents. The child doesn't present saying, I have pyloric stenosis. The child usually presents saying, I have abdominal pain. And just looking at whether it's of an intermittent nature, sort of a colicky nature, or a dull, insidious nature can help you a little bit hone down on what things in the differential diagnosis you may want to loop in, consider, or put on your differential if your first few thoughts didn't seem to work out based on your workup. Thank you guys so much.